Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask that you continue to bless those that are here, Lord. Uh, bless those that support and give to the church, Lord. And bless them, Lord, in many ways, whether it be financial, spiritual, emotional, uh, uh, financially, Lord, whatever it may be, Lord, you're in control of that, Lord. But let us be obedient to you, and let us be obedient to the call of God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Yeah. All right, so uh, if you have your Bible with you, you're certainly welcome to turn to Philippians. But I am uh, I'm in uh, a sermon series on the book of Philippians. It's very short. There's only four chapters in the book of Philippians. Uh, you really could go home today after church and, and read the four chapters, read it very slowly. It shouldn't take you more than a half an hour or so to read this. But it's a very good book. It's a, very, it's a book of encouragement. It's a book of instruction, and there's a lot of good theology in there. Uh, so uh, I encourage you that if you have not read the book of Philippians lately, or if you haven't read the book of Philippians as I'm going through this sermon series, I encourage you to go home today and spend some time reading through the book of Philippians, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll learn something from it. How can you not learn something when you read Scripture, when you, when you celebrate on Scripture and, 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 and look to Scripture? So today, what I've done is I've, I've broken down the chapters. We've went through all these chapters, and I'll, I'll be doing chapter 3 today, and, and God willing, next week I'll be doing chapter 4. But we see in the book of Philippians, in chapter 1, we see this is a, a letter from the Apostle Paul <clears throat> and Timothy to the church at Philippi, uh, and he's talking about how thankful he is uh, for their service, for their partnership, and he mentions in chapter 1 that he thanks them for their partnership uh, in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, and he also gives us great encouragement. You know, the Apostle Paul, as I indicated in many of the other sermons, that it seems that when Paul is in jail and writing the letters from jail, he's got a softer touch. Because we, when he's out of jail, he's like a, a theological, you know, a force, a tour de force, where he's just really laying things out and chastising and correcting the churches uh, uh, unabated. Uh, but here he's got a very nice tone uh, in the book of Philippians. I really enjoy the book of Philippians. It should be a very good book for all of you because it gives us a lot of encouragement uh, for our daily living. And, and this is what he said in the first, uh, the first pericopes or the first verses of the book of Philippians. He said this, and I love this uh, portion. There's a lot of portions in Philippians that I really love. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that great and encouraging for all of us knowing that? That we will uh, continue in the work of the Lord and be blessed in the work. Uh, and then he also talks about that, you know, the sacrifices that he's made, that he's been, you know, he's been in, in chains, uh, he's been jailed for the gospel. And he was able to look at that circumstance of life, and we see in, uh, in Philippians verse 12, that he says this, and listen, listen to the attitude the Apostle Paul had, and maybe we could adopt an attitude like this in our lives. Now, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I mean, so he was beaten, he was jailed, and he's thinking to himself that all this is going on, and it's actually advancing the gospel. And it's just so repugnant to the way we think as Americans, and we think in the American church, that you know it's got to be a bed of roses name it and claim it. And if you pray for something and you don't get it, well, that's because you don't have enough faith. And they fail to uh, realize that God is at work in our lives in very mysterious ways and ways that we can't understand all the time. Uh, and, and it really takes a lot of faith to live like that, especially when you're in jail and prison uh, and, and, and doing things for God and you're being, uh, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, called out on that and being persecuted for that and uh, that may happen in your life but he understood God in his life and he understood the work of the Holy Spirit and he even said you know as long as Christ is priest, preached and this is interesting because he said this because I think it's relevant to the American church now he said what does it matter the important thing is see it says the latter do so some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry others out of goodwill but he says Whatever, what, what does it matter? The important thing is, is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. So I guess I can take solace knowing that many of these guys on TV that are preaching, men and women for that matter, uh, you know, I guess Christ is preached, right? I guess the Apostle Paul would say that we disagree with it. We don't, under, we don't agree with the theology and, and much of what's being done. But uh, oftentimes, I guess Christ is preached somewhere in there. I think that's a stretch for me to say that. But the Apostle Paul said that, and uh, I guess we have to live with that. So Paul is really, really analytical 
uh, in, in, in the church in the time of which he lived as a theologian would be. So, uh, and then he says this, he says in, in verse, uh, toward uh, uh, verse 20, that uh, whether, uh, whether uh, I suffer, uh, whether, uh, whether in life or death, Christ will be exalted. I mean, that's a tremendous martyr's attitude that Paul has. And then he talks about whatever happens to us in our life, conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel, which is very difficult to do. So that's basically a little summary of, of, of chapter 1. And then I went into chapter 2 with the humiliation of Christ. And many of you thought that the humiliation of Christ was when Christ was naked on the cross, dying for our sins and uh, uh, reconciling us to God. But uh, I suggest to you that the humiliation of Christ is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, which says, Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man. So we talked about the canonic theory uh, of what Jesus went through. Uh, and that is what I suggest to you is the humiliation of Christ found in Philippians chapter 2. As we press on through uh, chapter 2, I said that you're all shining stars. It says this. Um, it says, Jesus said... Uh, Paul said to the church, Do everything without complaining or grumbling, uh, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. The church should be shining like stars in the universe. And I don't know if we've accomplished that yet. So then we get to uh, Philippians chapter 3, and uh, there's definitely some portions of uh, Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we have the Apostle Paul. Uh, and we have his introduction uh, of to his credentials. Uh, and he says this about himself. He says, uh, and I'll paraphrase that, I have no confidence in my own self. I have no confidence in my flesh. And then he said something very interesting, and it would, it would come across as being arrogant or being conceited. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, uh, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. I mean, this is a bold statement by Paul. And he's saying, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. I mean, this is tremendous words when you read this. You have to remember, this is a man that's in prison, that's been tortured and beaten, uh, and is being persecuted for his belief and for sharing the gospel. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I mean, can you imagine a preacher preaching words like, uh, unfortunately, I haven't heard words like this preached from the American pulpit recently. I mean, these are such beautiful words and understanding words and deep words of really knowing Christ and knowing the sacrifices that Christ oftentimes puts on us. And we've lost that because we've made the gospel, we've tried to make it contemporary. We've tried to fit in like the rest of the world. Let me read to you uh, something that uh, I, I, I came across in, in preparation for trying to figure out what I'm going to be sharing with uh, in, the, uh, in the next sermon series. And I was considering uh, doing a sermon series on John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. This is written in the 1500s. Uh, much of it has been lost, but uh, it's the second best-selling book in world history, Pilgrim's Progress. And it's intertwined with Scripture and Christ redemption, justification, forgiveness of sins. It's things that the church doesn't talk about. But I want to put that in juxtaposition to what the church does talk about. The purpose-driven church, the purpose-driven life, and probably all of us have read those books at some point in time. But this is what I believe R.C. Sproul, this is a quote from, I think, R.C. Sproul uh, or John MacArthur. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, here's, here's what he says about the purpose-driven life in those books. Uh, and the, and in, in, compar in comparison to Pilgrim's Progress, which is, uh, which if you haven't read it, it's it's one of the most classic literary and Christian theological works in all the world, uh, standing uh, right underneath the Scripture. It says this: the purpose-driven life. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, we see set forth in masterful literary style the depths and the riches of the biblical gospel. When we compare it to the purpose-driven life 
we see a book in which it is difficult to find a full explanation of the biblical gospel. Justification, the relief from the burden of sin that weighs us down, weighs the soul down, is all but absent in the setting forth of a new and different gospel of achieving or discovering purpose in one's life. One of the leaders of the, uh, of the recent emerging church movement boasts that he has not mentioned the word sin in the last 10 years of his preaching. He wants to make sure that his people will not feel crushed by guilt or by loss of their self-esteem. When the acute awareness of guilt is removed from the conscience, there is no sense of burden of sin. There is no sense of being under the crushing weight of the law of God that bears down upon our souls relentlessly. See, the church needs to have a little bit of that. You know, the church for so long don't want to offend how you feel. And I'm, as you can tell from every week of preaching, I'm very worried about how you feel when you leave church. I want to make sure you feel good. And I'll tell you whatever you want to hear to make you feel good. But that's the mentality oftentimes of the church. Really, pastors should be trying to clear the churches out with truth, with the gospel. And so this is, this is in comparison of what happens after uh, four or 500 years of the gospel being whittled down. So uh, I, I'm thinking about doing a sermon series on, on, on Pilgrim's Progress, which is really just the gospel narrative, much like uh, a Christmas carol, uh, even more so than that. There's a gospel narrative uh, in many of these old literary writings, and oftentimes we have to find them. Uh, and certainly, that would be a good exercise. But for today, I will finish up uh, uh, pressing on in life. How do you press on in life when you have had so many setbacks? How do you press on in life when you've had sickness, disease, death, and all these circumstances that go on? Well, you press on through Christ. I mean, we can't do it in our own strength. Uh, Paul can't do it in his own strength, and we can't do it in our own strength. So it's uh, pressing on in life. It's Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14 on the back of your bulletin. Let me read this uh, for you because it's, it's one of my favorite verses. It's not my favorite verse, but it's one of my favorite verses. Uh, it may be my second favorite verse, but it says this. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so as we read this, there's four aspects uh, that I want to touch on uh, briefly, and, and that'll conclude basically chapter 3, and then we'll move on to chapter 4. The final sermon will be next week. The first thing is this, that we learn from chapter 3, and these are things that I came up with and I looked at, and I think that I tried to make it as simple as it could be so you could make it applicable to your life. Number one, we should strive in discipleship through Christ. So first and foremost, there has to be discipleship in one's life. There has to be, other than coming to a church service for 65 minutes, that is dy dynamic as it may be with great music and preaching and these things, that's not enough. There needs to be discipleship in your life, a good Bible study, a good prayer meeting. All those things, there are elements that come together to make one a disciple of Christ. You can't be a disciple of Christ going to church for 65 minutes a week, and that's all that you do. You need to read. You need to pray. You need to be in a Bible study. You need to continue on. Look, when I teach these things, I'm telling you that I'm learning more than you're learning. Because every time I prepare a message, any time I prepare for the class upstairs, I'm learning more uh, and, and becoming more uh, familiar with the gospel. And, and it becomes, you know, the, the, the New Testament now is, is, I have almost full recall of the New Testament now because it's been studying and preparing and message after message and book after book. And there's very few aspects that I, that I don't understand because I've actually read it, studied it, preached on it, and thought about it because it's part of a discipleship process that even your pastor is going through a discipleship process each and every week. When I come here on Wednesday, I'm so grateful if my schedule allows that I can be here Wednesday to share with you and to talk with you and to talk about Scripture. It's a beautiful thing to be able to gather together and talk about Scripture. And then on Sundays, we have our church service. But we also have the Kelsey School. And all these other things are geared toward discipleship. So the first thing is that we should strive in discipleship through Christ. 
And that's what the American church is missing, discipleship. Discipleship programs, they need to make disciples. So that's what Paul is suggesting us in this book of Philippians, that we should strive in discipleship. Everything points to Christ. Every time Paul writes something, he's pointing at Christ, not at himself. So we should strive in the same way uh, in discipleship through Christ. The second thing is this. We should forget the things which are behind us. Now, uh, I want to clarify this, is that uh, we, we want to try to forget the things that hold us down, right? Many of us have had trauma in our life, negative circumstances in our life, uh, you know, troubling things, health concerns, whatever it may be. And sometimes we get so consumed, whether it's a relationship, we get so consumed with these things that they drag us down and we can't move forward in life. Have you ever, I'm sure all of us know somebody, or even ourselves for that matter, that people are so obsessed with the past that they can't move on to the future. And it holds them back. And I think Paul is saying here, we should forget the negative things that have held us down in our walk with Christ. So we can look back at the things that Christ has done in our life to encourage ourselves and encourage our faith. But I don't think that's what Paul is talking about. I think what Paul is talking about is the things that bind and the things that hold us down. And oftentimes, many times, as John Bunyan would say, that's the burden of sin. Sin in our life binds us down. And we can't move forward. You know, we were, uh, whatever it may have been, many, many have problems with alcohol, drugs, whatever, whatever it may be, and those things are impediments to our relationship with God. And whatever it may be in our lives that we go through, and none of us are sinless, right? We're, we're all sinners, right? But we, we, we really keep the goal of Christ uh, as forefront, that we want to be conformed more to his likeness and image. That's, that's why we shed off those things that bind us down. And Paul is saying here, maybe you have to forget those things and forgive yourself too and move on so God could work in your life in the here and now. Then the third thing is this. We should grasp the things which are before us. And how often are things right in front of us and we fail to recognize what they are? You know, sometimes we're looking for God in all the wrong places, right? I mean, there was a song, I guess, years ago, looking for love in all the wrong places. I think it was a country song. But that has such true application that we look for these elements in all the wrong places. You know, it is here, right? It's here in your life. It's your relationship with Christ. It's your daily walk with God. It's your daily discipleship. It's your daily time in prayer. It's your time in reading. It's your time in church. See, we should grasp the things which are before us. And it may be right underneath your nose. And you don't realize that. And then the fourth is this. We need to pursue the things which are prepared for us. And my question is this. What has God prepared for you? Do you know? Well, you need to pr pursue the things of God. I mean... Uh, you know, I know what my lot is, and I need to pursue that with all my excellence, with all my knowledge, and with all my zeal. And the day that I can't do that will be the day that the Lord stops me, right? But we all have to have that attitude. This is a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be behind this pulpit each and every week. There's no guarantees in life, right? But I know we have to be zealous and pursue the things of God, and we have to pursue those things relentlessly, right? The time is short and the work is great. Look, if you can't know it by now, it's a dark place out there in the world. And, 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 you know, people are going to hell. People are sending themselves to hell because they have no relationship with God. They have no understanding of God. They're more concerned, and I may have had to repent for this too myself, they're more concerned with the one o'clock football game than they are with their, their spiritual condition. They're more concerned with making sure they get to the bar to get something to eat and drink than their spiritual condition. All those things are so insignificant and inconsequential, and yet the society puts so much emphasis on those. I mean, sports is a religion in this country, and I was in that cult for many years as a young boy, but thankfully I was able to extricate myself through the help of my mother, that I would get punished if I was a little too rambunctious watching the football games. But Needless to say, I say that jokingly, but you all know that's the, tr that that's the truth. You know, Saturdays and Sundays, you know, sports, bars, and then Sunday, it's a national holiday. It's the National Football League, and, and I love football too. But um, we have to get our priorities right, and we have to strive in discipleship, forget the things which are behind us that are negative, that hold us down. We should grasp the things before us 
and then actually pursue those things with zealousness and excellence. And all of you could do that. You don't need to be up here to do that. So as we contemplate these things and we contemplate the book of Philippians, what, what encouraging words uh, he gives us. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which where Christ Jesus took hold of me. We need to say these things in our lives and realize, put everything in perspective. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. I consider everything a loss to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For who? Sake. I've lost everything. Here's a man that has nothing, but has everything. He has nothing in the world standards, but he has everything in God's standards. Which one do you want? The world has selected this one. I want everything in the world's eyes, and God is non-existent. The Christian church needs to say, I don't care about all this other stuff. I want everything in God's eyes. See, Paul understood that it had that theology. We don't. We need the theology. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the great words of the Apostle Paul, sharing with the Philippian church of pressing on toward the goal in life, and those goals have ramifications in eternity. We thank you for this, and we also pray for whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all these great promises, and they're promises and they're truths that you've not only given uh, the Apostle Paul, but you've given to the church and you've given it to us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.